You know, based on some of the videos we've done recently, you would get the impression that I'm very anti-EV. Because the videos we've done have been pointing out some of the dangers and the lunacy associated with the current push for electric cars. But the truth of the matter is, nothing could be further from the truth. I have nothing at all against electric cars. I have a problem with the push, the push of a technology before it's ready, before it's time. But I don't want to get into any of that. I don't want to get into the politics of all of this stuff. I want to tell you guys a cool story. Right? But I have to lead it off with this. Right? These are comments that we get all the time. And this one, actually, this one wasn't on one of those EV videos. This had to do with a, a, a bad parts, defective substandard part video that we did. But this is a common sentiment. I see this all the time. So let me read this. Does this guy know we have EV cars now? The industry, low-key, doesn't care about catering to a dying-slash-dead industry, gas cars. I imagine there was pushback-slash-ignorance surrounding the horse and buggy being taken over by the smoking machine-slash-gas transportation. Oh, God. All the time, I get that comment all the time, people equate my view towards these things as those of the people from the turn of the last century. They, oh, no. I'm never going to give up my horse. I'm never going to give up my buggy and my whip, right? You've never heard me say a negative word about electric motors, about electric cars, the concept of powering a vehicle using electricity. I completely understand the superiority of the electric motor to the internal combustion engine. Yes, the internal combustion engine is my first love. There's no question about it. But I recognize the validity of all machinery. I love steam locomotives. It doesn't mean that I, I reject goods because they came to me through a, a diesel electric or just an electric train. No. It's about the technology not being ready. And that analogy of the horse and muggy guys rejecting the internal combustion engine is completely inaccurate on a couple of different levels. Jay Leno has a car. Jay Leno did a video on his, uh, he has a, what they call a Baker Electric. So Baker was, and uh, there's a whole story to go with this, but all right. So Baker was one of the electric car manufacturers at the turn of the last century. At one point, especially in, in major cities like New York City, EVs actually outnumbered internal combustion engine cars. This was like the, the late 1800s, the early 1900s, up until around 1910, 1915, like that. All of the things that the current EV crowd talks about, um, electronic charging infrastructure, places to charge these cars, and uh, replaceable batteries even, were concepts Edison developed a nickel iron battery specifically for electric cars. And part of the plan, and, and actually, actually it, was, it was done in certain locations, part of the plan was to just pull up and they would swap your batteries and then you'd go on the way. No time wasting recharges. This was all done 120 years ago. There's nothing new under the sun. The thing that killed the electric car back during the turn of the last century is the same exact thing that is the, the main folly behind electric car, the electric car push of today. And that's the simple fact that electric cars operate on energy that was converted someplace else, the material was turned into energy someplace else, and then it's stored in the batteries in the car and then it went down the road. The internal combustion engine, the ICE, it makes that conversion on the fly. The car makes the conversion itself. So that efficiency right there has not changed. That, that concept of efficiency has not changed. At some point, it, EVs will be able to generate their own electricity as they go down the road. But that technology is nowhere near ready to go. So the thing that killed, the main thing that killed the EV during the last century was the development of the electric starter by Kettering. And with that, I mean, it, it, the primary market for EVs back in the early days was women, mostly because there were no electric starters. 
So to fire up your car, you had to get out there to all hand crank, and it took some muscle. And if you didn't hit it just right, it'll throw you on the ground. If you've never, if you've ever, never hand cranked a car, you can't appreciate the finesse that it takes to get it just right, and the muscle to get it just right. It was much easier for a woman to get into an EV and go and just go right on down the road, or the old man cranked his deal. So that was that was the thing that killed the EV in the last turn of the century. But like I said, I have I have personal connections to the the, the electronic car, the electric car. That the, the first is that I'm a Mopar guy, and every single Chrysler product ever built owes its existence to an EV. The Electrobat, a car that was built in 1894, 1895 in New York City. Electrobat went out of business. The company was eaten by another company, eaten by another company, eaten by another company, and so on and so forth down the road until it all ended up under the roof of Walter P. Chrysler, Chrysler Corporation. So all, every Mopar, traces its lineage back to an EV. And then there's Staten Island. And Baker, this guy Baker, Walter C. Baker, this guy was over the top. Now, I don't know if he had an association with Tesla, but the two of them were kind of cut from the same mold. I'm, I'm sure they could sit down over lunch and have some pretty interesting conversations. So Baker was a businessman. He was marketing these, these electric cars to the, to the general public. But he was also a big believer in the technology, and he was, uh, this, this guy was out there, right? But in a good way. So Baker had built himself a streamliner. Now, you, you got to picture this now. This is like 1905. We're talking about the average car, the typical car, was literally a horseless carriage. It was a carriage with a little three horsepower motor, and, and it just chugged down the road in its big wooden spoke wheels. I mean, it was, this was as crude and as primitive as you could possibly get. Baker built this electric powered streamliner. So you look at this thing, it's funny, when you look at it in a, in a, in a picture with other cars of its era, it looks like a Photoshop. It's like, no, this thing couldn't possibly have existed back then, but it did. Baker built this full on streamliner, had powered by an electric motor, I think it was like a 12 or 15 horsepower electric motor, and it was loaded with these Edison nickel iron batteries. And his goal was to be the quickest and the fastest guy in the land. And he was going to do it electric. He was going to prove the concept of electric. Company. So my connection with this is that in 1905, the AAA decides that it wants to have uh, a speed contest to figure out who's the fastest of the fast, who's, the bad, who's got the baddest car in the land. And they're going to do this on Staten Island. I was born in Brooklyn, but I was raised on Staten Island. And the place on Staten Island where they were going to do this was a stretch of what's now called Highland Boulevard. I don't know what it was called back then, but it was, it's now called Highland Boulevard. And it was one of the few paved sections of Staten Island. Back then, there were like little, little sections, there were like villages here and there on Staten Island, but most of it was farmland and woods. But there was this one developed area on the south, on the south shore today called Highland Boulevard, and it was paved. And this is where they were going to hold their event. So the geography of this, the starting line for this event would have been right around the intersection of Highland and Seaview. And this is significant, right, for, from, from a personal perspective. The finish line, the end of the shutdown area, would have been right about Highland and New Dorp. So now, back in the 70s and the 80s, when I was out there, that was the action spot. It was one of the main action spots. That stretch between Seaview and New Dorp Lane was loaded with traffic lights. And on any given night, there'd be dozens of cars out looking for a race. And what we would do is we would roll up and down that section of the boulevard and square off at stoplights. So we'd line up a stoplight, and we would run it out for a year or two, right? A couple hundred feet. And if there was parity in the cars, if one didn't just run away and hide from the other, then we would go to Seaview Avenue, and we would race on Seaview. So back then, there was just the hospital there and really nothing else. And it was just a wide, flat, straight road, and we could race there all night, nobody would bother us. 
So that was, that's my personal connection with this area that this race took place at. So Baker is, is flogging on this streamliner that he's got. It's faster, it's, it's way faster than the technology of the day is allowing. He has a few incidents along the way testing and developing this thing. At one point, all four wheels came off the car simultaneously, and he, he ended up just sliding to a stop on a, on a chassis of this car. He had a few incidents. Because again, this is 1904, 1905. There is no technology for going fast with a car. You're still using wooden spoke wheels. Under this swoopy, futuristic, I mean, it, it's actually, it kind of looks like the Jocko liner in, in some, some aspects. But under this swoopy, streamlined bodywork is a horseless carriage. Right? And now this guy is going to take this thing and try to top 100 miles an hour with it. So they have this event on Staten Island on that stretch of Highland Boulevard. And uh, not called Highland Boulevard at the time. I should know what it was called at the time, but I don't. This story was actually, this story was told to me, I was, I guess I was about 15 or 16 years old, and uh, there, I don't want to get like off on a long sidetrack tangent, but um, one of the guys, um, Mr. Stegman, he had a, a, he ran a shop out of his garage in Tottenville, and Mr. Stegman was probably 70, 75 years old at the time, I was like 15, 16, I bought my first 440 from him. And uh, he's the guy who told me this story. And I, even he was too young to have experienced it, been there witnessing himself, but it was told to him by somebody who was directly there as part of it. So they, they, I grew up with this knowing that this was like kind of a legacy in the history of my, my turf. So they set up to run this race. Baker shows up, cars as tight as he can make it, and uh, they run. So. A few cars go, Baker's, Baker's hold off like to the end of, towards the end of the event. So a few cars run and they're all clustered in like the 70, 75 mile an hour range. Baker's turn comes up. So he lets it go, builds up slowly. About halfway down the course, he pours it on, right? This thing hits a clock 105 miles an hour. 105 miles an hour. I'm, I mean, put this in perspective, what was going on in the world. The Wright brothers hadn't left the ground. This guy's going 105 miles an hour with an electric streamliner on a street on a Highland Boulevard. Crazy. He's got everybody, I mean, just totally outclassed in every way. But aerodynamics weren't quite understood at the time. And while he made a car that was really swoopy, it wasn't exactly efficient as so this thing gets light. I don't know if it actually took off or not, but it got light enough that he lost control of it. And he spun it around a couple of times and ended up sliding off the course and into a crowd, in, into a, a group of people. Two of them were killed on the spot. Now, where this, where this accident took place should pro would probably be exactly about where the 122nd precinct is today. At least that's, that's how it was explained to me by Mr. Stegman almost 45 years ago. Um, ran into a crowd, he killed a couple of people instantly. I think one other person died in the hospital afterwards and there were a bunch of injuries. And that was the end of the event. But he had gone 105 miles an hour in 1905. So two, two things came to this. First was that the, the record was not recognized because of the fatalities. They just wanted to sweep the whole event under the, under the rug. I was just like, hey, this didn't happen, right? So the, the speed record was never logged or never recognized as an official land speed record. And then the other thing that happened was, this is like such, this is typical New York City cop, I know, because I've been through this myself, not with the fatality part, but uh, the, the, the soon, like, as soon as the dust settled, the cops ran over to the car, the wreckage, the driver, Walter, Walter and, and his, his mechanic were alive and they arrested them on the spot, right? And charged them with manslaughter, right? Or homicide, whatever, whatever the charge was, they charged them with killing these people on the spot. So they brought them in, but they were released almost instantly because it was, it was noted at that point that the people who were killed 
were outside of the zone reserved for spectators. So they had basically they had snuck over the, the, the ropes or whatever barriers they had, and they were in a place where they could have got snuffed, and they did. So at that point, the charges were dropped and they were released. But that's like such a typical New York City cop thing, right? Just <laughs> arrest first and ask questions later. So, but anyway, yeah, I, I am I am not anti EV. I'm I'm I'm. I understand. I get it. I, I, have a, I have a long mental history with electric vehicles. I've thought about this concept and this, this process many, many times over the course of my life. They don't fit my lifestyle, otherwise I would have one. Okay, from a gear perspective, yes, the internal combustion engine, I love these things. Right? My life is based around the internal combustion engine. But I don't have an EV because they don't fit my lifestyle. They can't make that energy con that energy conversion on the fly the way an internal combustion engine was. No, I, I would never replace my completely. Oh no, goodbye internal combustion engine. I'm all electric from now on. But I'm absolutely not allergic to. I, I get it. I get the power. You've never heard me say a bad word about the power they produce, the efficiency. Never, because I don't feel those ways. I'm totally okay with electronic power. I'm not good with battery power, and I'm not good with pushing a technology before it's ready. When the time is right, we'll have it, and the EV will take the place of the internal combustion engine. And, you know, that's as it should be. That's evolution. That's things moving on. But I hope you got something out of that. I'll see you tomorrow.